The first rule of the con is you can't cheat an honest man. It's never been done. It can't happen. Impossible. The only way the only way this thing works is if you want something for nothing. So find somebody who wants something for nothing and then give them nothing for something. I'm Chris Bivey. And I'm Eddie Webb. And today on Journalist, we talk about the con on Hustle. Good morning, listeners, afternoons, whenever it is you're listening to it. For me, it is a wee hours of the morning. And as I was telling Eddie, I had insomnia last night. So I am not on my usual par today. So I, I warn you now, if you want to skip this episode, I would say still don't do it because Hustle is an amazing show. Yes. Eddie, unfortunately, has the horror of looking at a document that I decided I wanted to expand on this week. And I wrote <laughs> in painstaking detail about Hustle. But I wrote in painstaking detail while I was super tired the past two, three days. And even now, as I look at it, I see the word detective. And I know detective is it spelled like that. So, Eddie, <laughs> how are you this morning? Or- Honestly, the document reminds me of that old uh, 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 Mark Twain witticism of like, I'm sorry, this weather is so long. I didn't have time to make it shorter. <laughs> <laughs> Which to everybody else is like, that's so weird. And to writers going, no, that's fucking true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I, and I will say that I will probably do what Chris is always inclined to do. Even more so now. Because I think today on Hustle, because Hustle is a type of show that you could put nothing or you could put a lot of something. Yeah. And I've got maybe three pages of notes. I will admit it at the top. I've got three pages of note, most of which I think are on the first episode. Hmm. Maybe I got more tired as I was writing. So, <laughs> um, and, and like Chris is beating himself a bit, but also to be clear, I also do want to go into painstaking detail about what is literally thirty seconds of television in episode four. So that it, it's not just all on Chris. Um, I'm going to do something a little different today than what we normally do, which is. How are you enjoying our short run as this is the last episode of this run, this mini series inside of a smaller series. It's part of a larger series that still has other mini series in it. Uh, honestly, I, I, I've been enjoying it. Um, we, we did it ad hoc uh, for our prisoner um, run, prisoner other stuff run. Um, it was nice because at the time it was like, I just had the brain power to get back into this. Um it, but uh, I'm glad because I'm by no means mad at the second half of Doctor Who that we have to talk about. I have, I'm excited for it. I'm looking forward to it. But it was nice to have a bit of a break. And also, these have been genuinely fun shows to talk about, which I don't think we would have probably gotten around to in any other, any other way. If it, it, it'd been like we kept our usual format, it's like we can't really pull together eight episodes of this. So maybe never we'll find the way to cram in something else by doing this short little thing. We talk about some really targeted stuff. And this has been just a really fun run of shows. Awesome. I feel much the same way. And I wanted to put it here in case our listeners like it and they want to let us know that if they want us to do micro runs, so we'll say about four episodes for us is a micro run, uh, let us know. Give us some genres that you might want or better yet, send us a TV show that you might want and then we would build the other three episodes around it. So we A, can get access to it and B, want to talk about it. Um, uh, but yeah, just for organization purposes, people listening will already know this, but like um, I have been structuring these as part of the season. So these are all part of season four four yes four um so rather than doing breaking it up and like having this be season five and next thing you know this is all season four just season four is going to have other stuff that doctor who in it um uh but yeah honestly i think this structure is just honestly a little better all right before we switch back to hustle i will say that i am i'm less than amused that a series idea i had and sent you in our private discord that was beautiful i scripted it out with like 10 different shows You're and he sent me back six of those shows cannot be viewed currently it's like oh come on man uh, okay that, that that actually is true i thought you were about the other series you pitched me um there's been so many of them um but yeah no there, there was one behind the scenes like there was one where uh, chris i was such excited about the idea but it's just so much of it wasn't streaming in the uk um which is gonna be honestly to be fair a problem we're gonna have i mentioned this before a problem we're gonna have going forward is that the uk it's not 
that they don't have as much streaming because they my god there's a lot of streaming services here um it's rather they naturally prioritize british and european programming um so they don't have as much american programming which means that we're going to try to find more stuff but weirdly the thing that chris pitched to me it was mostly the british shows i actually couldn't find in streaming so it was it's yeah. it's, it's it's just a it's a big clusterfuck um so uh sometimes it's going to be a case of where we either if i could find an alternative great um but sometimes like, like yeah, this is just not available in one of the two countries but the other person can just has on dvd or whatever so like fuck it we're doing it anyway um so our remit of every episode something that people can find streaming frankly was was american century to begin with and now that i'm on not in that ecosystem anymore i'm 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 recognizing the limits a bit more so we're i'm going to continue to refine our limits on this but sometimes you know like i said like someone pitched uh, a really cool cartoon a while back and it's like it's not available anywhere it was uh uh the battletech cartoon i think yeah and then she's like you can't find that anywhere legally uh, so <laughs> yeah. well actually now also that we're riffing a little bit because that's what i do when i'm when i'm tired and i'm all over the place i might totally change this entire episode the last minute on any and we not talk about hustle today and we talk about no, I random talk about stuff hustle. and then come back to hustle um I want to talk about hustle since we do, I'm going to even promote the Patreon here. Since we do do Patreon episodes now, I was thinking that we could readjust our format that if we need to purchase them, we purchase them. And mm. the Patreon would pay for Eddie to have the privilege of being able to purchase the selected episodes, if not the whole series, depending on how much it costs, because the Patreon doesn't make that much money, um, for <laughs> what we're going to watch. Yeah, I mean. Like a monthly Patreon episode now. I mean, because like, uh, if that's something that financially makes sense, I mean, uh, because there's some of these are cases where it's like, I can't get a streaming, but I can buy the individual episodes, and so it comes up to like maybe ten pounds uh, to watch, or like I can find the season on DVD on eBay for ten pounds or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to do that too. Um, that would be perfectly fine by me. Um, and in fact, uh, there's been a couple of shows that I've been debating pitching because I do I can get them pretty cheap on uh, DVD uh, or whatever. Um, because like there are some shows that you just can't get on streaming, but they're pretty available on video. Like we've talked about spoilers for shows that may never happen. Um, uh, but we've talked about uh, things like uh, Who Done It, which is a British crime game show thing that Patrick, that's uh, uh, John Pertwee was the host of. Um, that it, you're just not going to find for love or money on streaming anywhere, but it's pretty easy to find on DVD. Stuff like and we that. talked about Cluedo too. So yeah. Um, yeah, Cluedo. We also talked about like like maybe the, the like we didn't we didn't do it, but we I I briefly floated the Korean uh leverage, which is yeah. pretty cheap on DVD and with English subtitles, but you just can't find it for streaming. Um so I mean yeah, that's something that we'll talk about and, and we'll take we can take offline and kind of play with. But uh um similar like with speechless, uh uh there's been a couple things that we've talked about doing. Um like I have floated uh doing a run of the Akira comic. Um, you floated doing Blue Marvel. Blue Marvel, you can get comic. all on Marvel Unlimited, but like Akira, you can't I haven't get anywhere. Read streaming. the Akira comic since I was in senior in high school. Yeah, I, I got. I don't uh, even know if it was all out then. I think there was maybe twenty or thirty issues. Yeah. Um. Uh. uh I do know from recent reading that uh, I believe Dark Horse did end up doing the whole run, but there was like a huge delay in the last like chunk of issues. Um, but I picked up the uh, uh, original manga um, with with the original illustrations um, oh, a while goodness. back, and I, I I think it's great. I was so excited by it. Um, so yeah, so I mean we may refine our format, but we'll tr I think we should keep it to like specials or like I think our general format of most of nearly all of these shows you try you relatively easily find them streaming at the time we're recording them. I think we should keep that as a thing. But if we in case you stray from that, I think it's okay, especially because we're looking on a barrel of get close to our, you know, we're past our hundred episodes. I mean, so we're looking, getting close to 150 at some point in the near future. So, I mean, we're doing this for a while. I think it's okay to shake up the format a bit. All right. So one of the things that, one of the reasons I want to bring it up on recorded air is we still work a lot. Well, I go out of my way and I think Eddie is dragged along somewhat, so unwillingly, <laughs> willingly sometimes to give you an idea of what it's like behind the scenes for us, because mm -hmm. I know as a budding podcaster two and a half years ago, I had no idea what it was like, and I would have loved to have insight into it. So if you've been listening to us for now over 100 episodes, I want to make sure you still get those snippets of useful information. If you want to go start your own podcast and get 20 dedicated listeners, regardless of what you talk about, who keep coming back. 
I mean, let, let's be honest. Like, we're not the super polished podcast where you get everything organized and structured. That's not what we do. Um, we've always been kind of very DIY. This is about just us two middle-aged men talking about shit we love. Um, so, I mean, like, I'm happy to talk about the behind-the-scenes stuff as long as it doesn't take up, you know, over 10 minutes of airtime like it is right now. <laughs> Technically, we're at the 10-minute mark because I did the intro. I said my intro bit and the music. And you made a great segue point when you talked about the Korean leverage because mm. when Americans walk by and they see Hustle, get that transition, um, yeah. they think that Hustle was in cause of leverage. But in reality, Hustle came first. That's why I wanted to end this run on Hustle. Okay. See, I didn't know that actually because um, when you first pitched Hustle, uh, uh, I'm – I'm going to borrow a phrase I've heard locally because I fucking love it. I live in East London. I didn't have a Scooby about what the hell hustle was. <laughs> um, and so you're like, hustle. I'm like, sure, I guess. Let me see if I can find it on streaming. Of course I can find it on streaming because it's a BBC production. It's on BBC iPlayer. No problem. There's eight series of it. I'm like, why have I never heard about this show? But when I first started watching it, I was like, oh, this is the British leverage, right? And it's not. It, it, it's not for a few different reasons, but – I didn't even realize until you just said it, but it came before leverage. So it sounds like instead leverage is the American hustle. I think hustle is probably in its fifth or sixth season when leverage aired. Wow. So like you had a lot of hustle and then you had leverage like Americans said, Hey, that looks like a really good show. I think we could make it more American. Which traditionally has not worked except for the few times where it actually does work so do we want to talk since we have a doctor who connection here do we want to talk about the american coupling i think that they made six episodes and they aired two before they just stopped it yes american coupling was terrible okay well, actually, you know, it's, it's actually shorter list to talk about the american versus the british shows that actually worked um because the office was a british show and to be honest i've watched the british office it's not good um, I've watched uh, the American one, and it's not good either. I don't know how it ran that long. But it's slightly better. <laughs> um, and also went for a lot longer. So there's that. Um, uh, actually, amusingly, uh, a digression. Um, I have seen the reverse just happen. Uh, so American Gladiators apparently showed up in England as just Gladiators. And now they're doing a reboot of just Gladiators here in England. I don't know if they're doing an American Gladiators reboot, but they're doing a British reboot of Gladiators. Because like, as of time recording, like this Friday, they're going to start showing on PPC. So, uh, so that happens. Tell me that you and Matthew are going to go down to the pub and have a few pints and watch this show. It's not wrestling, no. but it is darn close to what some people think wrestling could be. God no, because A, Matthew has to take like a two hour train to get here. And B, have you seen the prices of a pint in London? Hell no. <sighs> Not yet, but I, I'm hoping next year when I reach a, a certain birthday, is it next year or year after next? I don't know. In the next two years, when I hit a certain birthday, I, I, I'm hoping to make my way over to the UK and other places. You should. And then I'll, then I'll spend the requisite 55 pounds to buy you a pint. <laughs> Well, look at this way. When Zora's there with us, she will only probably cost 10, pint uh, 10, pints to, 10 pounds to get a little bitty juice of a little thing of apple juice. <laughs> look at that. She probably will not drink a pint. No. <laughs> I can give alcohol to your kid. Um, Is this a time to talk about the well-worn older American tradition where they used to give kids little bits of whiskey and stuff on the gums to knock them out when they were still infants to get them to stop crying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, get your kid drunk, stop crying. That's what my grandmother did when I was a kid, frequently. Because right. uh, much no, anyway. like now, I have a propensity for talking, and I won't stop. Even though Eddie wants to talk about the show, I'm going to talk about a young Chris <laughs> who has a perfect recollection of being a, a 12-week-year-old child. Just so you know, there I, I was. You. I, I can mute what? you, just so you know. I can, I, can, I can push the mute button and stop you talking. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but no, anyway. Uh, I've forgotten that there are a couple other shows that I had in my head when I said it, but I forgot what they are now. But there were a couple of – oh, um, I would argue Elementary versus uh, Sherlock although that happened simultaneously. It wasn't one or the other. Um, we're just going to be vastly disagreeing on Elementary, I think, for all time. I, I I bet you if we do a run of Elementary and I pick three episodes, I think you will turn around on Elementary over Sherlock. 
All right. I, I, I find it difficult to believe, but I, I am open because for some reason I like Peacemaker, and that's because of your recommendation. Lucy, Lucy Liu plays a character who is garbage at fighting. It's amazing. <laughs> and I now want to pitch, maybe at time of recording, this may give us away, but we just find out that, oh, I forgot his first name, but I think his last name's Chestnut, is playing Watson in a TV series. Yeah. Which happens, I think, after Sherlock has died. Yep, and apparently it's a modern day one, which is interesting. Yeah, so I'm I'm really curious what that's going to be like, and I want to watch yeah. that. <laughs> and if it happens, it'll be the second Black Watson I know of. Let's see, look how awesome that is. Yeah. Uh, Any other successful shows that came over from there that you want well, to discuss before we transition? Not back really. No. I, I, I'm scrounging my head. I, I know there have been a few others, but um, it, it's certainly not like the Red Dwarf, American Red Dwarf, for example. Um, that was not a good example of it. Uh, Cat came over for the American Red Dwarf. I'm sorry I know. that he did it. because it was a horrible show. Yeah, a <laughs> level. Um, uh, no, I mean, so the point of all that was that when I that when I first started watching Hostel, I admit I was like, okay, so this is British leverage. A, that's incorrect because of the timing that you just said. Uh, but also B, I think for me, um, there's a different structure, right? Because like leverage is ultimately, as I said before, during leverage, it's ultimately a heist film. It's a, it's a TV show based around each episode is functionally a short heist film. Uh, and that's not what hustle is because hustle's ultimate is in leverage. While everyone can be a con artist, there really is one specific con artist in the team. This is a team of con artists. And that does give a very different flavor. There's a lot of overlap in the Venn diagram, but they're not identical. There's actually a different vibe and flavor just from that structure that happens from yeah. it. And then there's also other things, which I'm sure we'll dig into about just how the show is presented that gives a different flavor. And to be honest, I'm going to say this on air, just having watched three episodes of this, I kind of like Hustle better than Leverage. <laughs> Because one of the things, though, for me is I debated really before I per put Hustle out there. I knew that I, I thought that it would be a good ender for the series. But at the same time, it barely meets our mandate, barely, of um, mm. criminals doing good. It meets our, it more than excels at our idea and joke about we could recall the series sticking it to the man. Right. Because they are criminals doing criminal stuff. But their primary targets are corrupt, big wig business people. Right. That is the only reason it falls into this category. Otherwise, right. it wouldn't fit at all. Yeah, because all the other shows are explicitly these people are on the wrong side of the law, and they're doing it primarily to help out the little guy. Hustle, they help out the little guy accidentally, <laughs> but really it's about making a shit ton of money. Yeah. So that's why I was I was wiffly waffly, but it's also why I wanted to end on it and not have it be in the middle anywhere because it would have definitely disrupted the flow of the shows. Right. I mean, this I, and I'm glad you did because this is one of those things where with the pre other free shows in front of it, you can see that more. Whereas your episode, right, if you started with it or put it in the middle, I think we would have lost that vibe. And so it's like you can see where how this there's some DNA of this in the other three shows we saw, but you can't, we wouldn't see that as clearly if you didn't watch those shows first. Yeah. Um, so one of the other things I thought was really, really interesting for behind the scenes stuff about hustle is that it ran for eight seasons. The mm -hmm. first three seasons were more and more successful so much so that by the end of the second season, um, the BBC was actually trying to get the American audiences into it to get some of that, you know, American money. Really? And, they amc i think is a network that said yes we fully support that and they like became a co-producer on the show and season four was also aired i want to say if i remember right simultaneously aired on amc as it was over there <clears throat> oh okay so this was before the bbc america structure right i think so yeah. like I, I have vague recollections and i listened to a behind the scene cast interview it doesn't talk about this part of it because i think the right. business I've noticed the older I've got, the more and more interesting I, the more and more interest I have in the business aspects of what's going on because it is has more drama in it than the actual show. Yeah, shows. yeah. <laughs> like that is fascinating. 
and then you have to try to work through the spin that the networks are putting on to whatever it is they're putting out for the public. Mm -hmm. Because for the American transition, when they did that, they lose Adrian Lester. Okay. And Danny, uh, Mark Warren, becomes the lead of the show for the oh. fourth season that's in America. And they bring in like some other black character to replace Adrian Lester. Literally, like Adrian Lester wow. leaves and bring in new black character. Danny is now the lead of the crew. And that is like their fourth season that I don't think does nearly as well. Yeah. And then Adrian Lester comes back at fun five, right? Yeah, but that's also when uh, Jamie Murray and Mark Warren step away from the show. Mm. And it comes back, I think, to be fully back to being BBC. I'm not sure of the American influences after that. I just know that fourth transition, that third and fourth season were interesting. And the BBC went out of their way to say it's not because of like anything behind the scenes. Adrian just wants to go and do more engaging work. Sounds right. a lot like... A, a Christopher Eccleston story about Chris just kind of wanting to move away from being the doctor. There's nothing here to see. Right. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. That said, I will say, um, weirdly, my first real exposure to Adrian Lester was um, the, uh, the Guardian several years ago did a bunch of really short YouTube videos where they just hired a bunch of actors to do short snippets of Shakespearean speeches. It was, it was in celebration of like the things like 700th anniversary of Shakespeare's death. And so they wanted to kind of show how Shakespeare can be interpreted by different people and whatnot. Um, and Adrian Lester doing Hamlet is fucking amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Adrian Lester doing anything is amazing. Well, yeah, but I was like, this guy's good. What else is he in? And it's like, and then you mentioned, like, right by the time you mentioned Hustle, I'm like, oh, Adrian Lester's in Hustle. Well, Jesus Christ, that's awesome. Let's see more of Adrian and Lester. Great. One of the reasons I specifically make the Christopher Eccleston joke there is because when Doctor Who came back, as soon as I heard Eccleston was leaving, I was all over the social media saying that I think Adrian Lester should have been his replacement for the Doctor. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, God, I, yeah. I love Tennant, but I wanted Adrian Lester to be the Doctor because that would have been fucking phenomenal mm -hmm. and i kept pushing and i'm still pushing for adrian lester to be the doctor patterson joseph joseph is also on my list to be the doctor but adrian lester is like top of the pops i may have even written a blog post about certain people that should have been doctors back in my <laughs> blog a decade ago uh oh wow actually i'm i'm, I'm scrolling through adrian lester's cv now and it's just like oh my god he's done so much cool stuff and he was Adrian Lester is also the lead in my favorite musical of all time. And it's hard to find this one, but it was a grainy copy, but he was Bobby in company by Sondheim. Oh, it's wow. Like a grainy copy. You can find like on YouTube somewhere and see it, but I saw it. It's my favorite musical with one of my favorite actors in my, one of my favorite lead roles. Fucking phenomenal. Um, I I'm digressing because of Adrian Lester. I'm squeeing a little bit. So I'll pull it back to be more focused on the show. Um, but he does come back around fifth season and then there's some other transitionary stuff and it stops at the end of at season eight. One of the things that I also found really interesting is that the creative team behind it wanted it to be a family dynamic. So you have like Adrian Lester's dad, you have Albert as a grandfather and you have Danny as a son it was sort of like their immediate sort of line of people to show like yeah. generations of the con evolving. And then they bring in Ash as an uncle and Stacy as as much as Danny is hitting on her, still the mother figure for the show to be with Danny. Right. It's hard to be with Mickey. Mm -hmm. So like that was an interesting part because they wanted to establish that family dynamic so they could have all those and totally avoid showing you their home life. Because in the interview, it talked about how they didn't want them to be like doing these flash things and go home and fix themselves like an egg and bacon sandwich. You don't want to right. see that in this show. It doesn't work. It distracts from the vibe. And the show is all about vibe. Yeah, and what's fascinating to me is uh, it was put together by the same team who did uh, Spooks, which has since been rebranded as uh, MI6, um, which is With good, good reason. Good. Right, for, for very good reasons that we will not go into it. If you need to know the reasons, we'll talk about it at some point, I'm sure, uh, on the Discord. Uh, but um, MI6 is very much not that. Like MI6 is very much uh, a show about... Um, how the job wears you down and how uh, being a spy ruins your home life and how the people you work with, you can't trust them. And so this is, and of course, I'm mean, obviously in a very different side of the law. So like 
hustle is pretty much the exact opposite of MI6 in, in every respect. Um, and in all in positive ways, like you said, uh, the found family dynamic, which was hinted at and suggested in leverage is just absolutely hammered in this version it's like you know, we are a family and i loved it actually i really liked that that strong emphasis because it gives a lot of the the character dynamics more more weight because it's not oh these are people that like each other and kind of stick around because they do good work which is again a very kind of american you know the vibe it's the leverage is great but it's also Ultimately, this is our job, and these are my coworkers. Um, hustle is no, we're a family. We stick together. We we support each other, um, and so it gives a extra heft to the character dynamics that's missing, frankly, in some of the other shows. The, the only other show that we've talked about that even remotely ties into this it was Poker Face, and even then, that was kind of the found family of the week for Charlie. And part of me wonders, though. I am in utter agreement with you, but part of me wonders if that is also because of the format, the way American does television compared to the way the British do television. Agreed. For the British, you have like six to eight episodes in, out, that's a season. For uh, the American television audience, we have 13 to 26 episodes. Right. So we can't support that solid, concrete feeling. We need to like sparse it out over the course of 26, 27 Star Trek Next Generation episodes for a first season. Right. Yeah. And also, I mean, at the time Leverage came out, it was at the point where DVR was becoming a thing, but you still couldn't reliably expect people to watch every single episode. So they still had to be relatively compartmentalized. Whereas, again, uh, the BBC model is they assume people would sit down and watch for six weeks, eight weeks, um, because it was an event. Uh, and so you could expect more kind of structure. And so you can have stronger character action. You absolutely do in this first series. No, I, I'm just really curious because we know that leverage ran, sorry, we know that hustle ran for eight seasons, but that's 48 episodes. That's yep. equivalent, like two or three seasons of another show at most. Right. And while it was eight seasons, it was only over the course of, well, okay. It was, it was eight years. Um, so it was about roughly one a year, but um, some of those probably were a couple than one year, you know. Yeah, because one of the things that they did point out for the first season is that the casting and everything happened <clears throat> somewhat quickly. But I know that uh, Robert Vaughn, who if you don't know who Robert Vaughn is, go watch a movie. And I would say go watch The Magnificent Seven, to be specific. Um, or, the, or The Man was, from Uncle. I'm sorry, go ahead. Or The Man from Uncle. True, or you could also see him in a little movie called Bullet for uh, my Steve Mc other Steve McQueen fans out yeah, there because I'm on a roll. Speaking of Bullet, that is a movie I may want to do for the Patreon. Um, <laughs> anyway, they originally he came over and they had sort of a chat with him, but they say we didn't have anything for him that we thought Robert Vaughn that would be good enough for Robert Vaughn. Mm -hmm. And so then, like a month later, they called him up and said, "Hey, if you're interested, sign the contract and be on the plane in an hour so we can start filming it a day." Like, that oh, is how it went. Wow. And all the actors talked about how chaotic the first season was because they had, like, a script or two at most written, like a script and a half, when they started filming. So they were still writing as they were acting. So you have all the extra drama and everything else going on. That's amazing. And the, um, the blueprint initially... Like, this is what happens when I pay attention to some after stuff. I have, like, more random tidbits of information than I usually do. <laughs> is that the blueprint for Mickey was actually originally supposed to be George Clooney. And the writer in his mind had, like, the idea of a white dude in his, like, his late 40s had done all that. And mm -hmm. it's a casting director that sent them Adrian Lester, who, like, blew them all away. And so they readjusted the role somewhat for Adrian Lester, like, making him younger adding a little bit more edge to it instead of being a Clooney type. And honestly, uh, I mean, we're, we're edging into talking about the first episode a little bit, but um, Mickey Bricks is far and away a better team leader to my mind um, than the leverage, right? Uh, because yeah, it's, it's not just another middle-aged white guy. And wow, it's not, explicit in the episodes we watched uh there is certainly a, a an amount of of not 
gravitas, um, but uh, groundedness, I think, that comes from his performance that makes – it's almost weird calling him a name like Mickey Bricks, right? Because it, it, it's it's such a, a London gangster name, and he does not get across the vibe of being a London gangster, but he ultimately is a London gangster. And – you're not you're correct because if you notice one of the things he does do is he throws a mean punch yeah like, yeah and it is something and we know that he went away we're gonna get in the episode right after this that he went away to prison it wasn't for like a con but for assault so you get right. like that extra physicality that's there without ever really having to see it it's implied by the past and occasional strikes of violence when needed but not too much of it right and uh, Vaughn does a great job of of like letting the the uh intensity just very slightly like, come at the edges of his performance like he always comes across as polished and professional but like that intensity that that violence is just there on the edges until it finally boils over um and so it's not scenery chewing scary gangster it's i can really like this guy and then every once in a while i remembered oh right he's terrifying um, and that's really, especially with the dynamic that's set up in this first series, it's, it's really important that you never, you kind of forget for a while that Mickey's scary, but that's important for a show about con artists that even the audience occasionally needs to be sucked into the con. Any, um, final thoughts or anything before we get into this? Uh, um, uh, also, uh, we, we, we kind of lost over all the cast. We didn't talk about all the cast, but like, um. Uh, uh, Mark Warren, honestly, I was like, oh, that's the guy from that one Doctor Who episode, uh, you know, who plays a who very different love character. with a piece of asphalt. Yes, and he's playing a very different character than he is in this show, <laughs> which I assume had to be um, intentional. Uh, uh, but I mean, uh, even like Robert Glenister, who played uh, Ash Morgan, um, again, like lots of actors that I've seen before, but in very different roles, and they're playing here. Um, and then you see them play the character that the characters when they're playing con artist characters, you know, when the actors are playing characters who are playing characters in the show, bit of a layer thing here. Um, but the, the personas they put up tend to be closer to the roles you tend to see them in, in other shows. So there's a neat little balance there of, we're not casting them as the characters you see them as but then they then play the characters you kind of used to seeing them as is a neat little way to again get the audience drawn into the con a bit more um so when you see again uh, uh adrian playing kind of very uh erudite well-spoken characters it's like oh okay yeah that's what i'm used to seeing him as then the, oh by the way he can knock you the fuck out it's like oh shit you know even though the show's always kind of made it clear that's the kind of people they really are it's really neat it's a neat touch and for the cast, I would say the only person I didn't know was uh, Robert Glenister, I think is how you said his name. Yeah, yeah. Only one I've never heard of. Yeah, no. Maybe um, I've seen him before, but no. Uh, uh, I have seen him in uh, kind of lots of bits and pieces of other things. Um, uh, mainly, he was uh, Salatine in Caves of Androzani, uh, which is <laughs> where you probably know him from. Yep, there we go. Um, uh, I've seen him in bits and pieces in Casualty. Uh, which is a kind of a, a medical drama show, which is one of the things I've just seen on TV occasionally, just flipping through channels. Um, uh, you know, he's uh, um, he was Thomas Edison in uh, Doctor Who at one point, which is weird. Uh, uh, Got a but, Baker run. Uh, yeah, um, but I mean, Colin, he was uh, he was uh, he's one of those people that like he's in lots of bit parts so it's that rare to see him in as kind of a lead um and so it's like oh it was very much the oh i know that guy and then i had to google him to figure out where i knew him from kind of thing but then once i saw him I was like this guy's been in everything but it's always like an episode here an episode there um and so i'm always appreciative of when someone who i've seen as a strong you know part of character actor of the week thing gets a regular you know like bruce campbell for example you know um gets a strong even if it's a secondary lead role. Um, and so to me, he was kind of that Bruce Campbell equivalent on this show. And he kind of uh, just filled that role. He kind of fills that, yeah. that a similar role. And since I want to make sure we take a moment to talk about Jamie Murray, this is the first place that I saw Jamie Murray, but then she sort of blew up and was on everything for a, a short one of time. Yeah. Uh, like from warehouse 13 to an array of stuff. And it was, it was good to see her again. I, I missed how much I enjoyed seeing her act. 
yeah, no, she's she's fantastic. And again, playing the uh, 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 the 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 sexy woman con artist is kind of a hard role. Um, but again, even here, like I, I feel like she does it better than her equivalents in Leverage because she has more to do than just be the sexy con artist. Yeah. All right. Are, are we ready for the con? Yes. Let's do this. Thirty something odd minutes in, the con is on. The scene opens with a killer soundtrack and a dashing fellow, Mickey Stones, a.k.a. Mickey Bricks, smiling at the camera. Then it switches to watching a rich white man steal a server's tip before quickly jumping to various <laughs> scenes of the con artist crew doing their specialty. And we know that Mickey believes in the long con and he's just returned from he just returned to London after being released from prison for assault. Then we get a shot of the rest of the crew, which we've got Albert who is a roper and mentor, the banker and lure is Stacy, the fixer's Ash, also known as uh, AKA Ash Three Stocks Morgan. I'm going to pause never, there. They entirely explain the Three Stocks thing, but they allude to it and they just move on. I love that. <laughs> I, For me, I'm going to assume that he was in prison and used soap in three different socks to assault someone with. That is... The probable interpretation and the one that I also agree with, but also implies that maybe he had some stock shoved down his trousers. <laughs> Which could also be true in prison. I'm just saying, my friend, it, it still goes back to there. All right. I, I am specifically pausing. I'm going to pause there from points because I went over that quickly. And there, but there's a lot of stuff that happens in that opening scene to give you like a full yeah. vibe of the show. Like the opening theme song is automatically kicking which my my jill mm. bit because jill walked by when i was watching um mm. she's like are you watching leverage that music sounds a lot like leverage oh no <laughs> and she's like wait a second you sure this isn't like a leverage sequel it's like no it's not it happened before leverage so yeah um the one thing i liked which i thought i was gonna hate but i ended up loving is the third wall breaks right when right off the bat, like Adrian Vaughn is staring at you and smiling, and it's Adrian very much Lester. the, or sorry, just sorry, Adrian Lester is like I'm smiling at you, and I'm like, and he, and it's, it's smiling. Like, you're gonna like me, and I'm like, God damn it, you're right, I am. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing that they really want to do to like stylize the show that they decided to do was those like freeze frames like that, where they yeah. cast sort of stops, looks at you. And talks to you but one of the objectives was not to overdo it and right. much of this show's credit i don't think they overdo it at all like it's it's strategic i i could take a little bit more than they give me so that's the best way to be you want people wanting more yeah i was worried it was going to be like parker lewis can't lose where they're constantly <laughs> cutting to the camera and, and that gets old real goddamn fast do you know there's a kid i love that show growing up i'm sure you did but if bet you watch it now, you get sick of the fucking cutaways. It it it, it is it is Arrow five years ago island levels of please stop. <sighs> a young teenage Chris hot take. Parker Lewis can't lose was infinitely better than the Ferris Bueller TV show they tried to make. They made fun of the Ferris Bueller movie. There you go. Fair enough. I have no comment. Good to know. Um, any any comments on the opening scene other than my jokes about uh, Parker Lewis? Uh, no, just the fact that I, I love the fact that the, the 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 old rich man just stealing servers tips is like the pettiest, fastest way to get someone against a character on TV. I think I've seen in a while. <laughs> All right, a uh, new detective inspector arrives at the police station to oversee the Mickey Brick surveillance that the police want. They know that Mickey is going to do one last score, and they have full bios in the entire team that they present to the new detective. The police state right here at the very top of the show that they don't go after the little guy. They go after big leaguers mm -hmm. to show you what type of cons they do, which then also, I'm going to take a moment to say, get you on their side. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, back in the luxury apartment, Albert breaks down their current target, Peter Williams, to Mickey and Ash. Williams is a wealthy, well-connected businessman who uses his first wife's money to make his fortune. His new young wife spent, according to them, spends too much of his money too fast for his likings. He also likes anyone in a short skirt mm -hmm. and along with being incredibly greedy. Mm -hmm. Mickey recruits Stacy, who is excited to see him and then slaps him for not staying in touch 
long enough? Back at the police station. The sergeant explains to the new detective that Mickey and Stacy used to be an item before he got married. Mm-hmm. Pause it. Uh, so the, the, the romantic subplot is, is frankly, I think one of the weaker parts of series one. Yeah. Um, and for exactly the same reasons we talked about in leverage, weirdly enough, um, it, it feels a bit forced. It feels like it's unnecessary. The chemistry is definitely there. Don't get me wrong. Um, actually it's something I think better than in leverage. I, I feel there's actual chemistry between the actors there. Um, but it does seem like this kind of a s- subplot of, mickey's ex-wife and how stacy fits in all of that that i think the show even realizes halfway through it's like you know what no one cares about this we don't care about this so kind of just it gets resolved but also doesn't really matter i think i agree that it's a weak plot because they don't know what they want to do with it mm-hmm. and then we have the danny sort of being in there to create the idea maybe of a love triangle which never yeah. goes anywhere like at all it it is a it is a triangle entirely from Danny's perspective. Otherwise, it is a line, <laughs> right? And but, I think part of it though goes into the making of television is that there's an expectation that if you have attractive people there, you're going to want there to be some sort of relationship. This hands down. I, I will say in the show's credits, um, and we're jumping ahead slightly. Uh, one of the things I liked was that they did use that to accentuate the tension between Danny and Mickey. Um, and so rather than being it's just about the relationship is this is one of many reasons why Danny and Mickey are in conflict for series one. Uh, so it was a good way to kind of bolt that onto another personal dynamic and accentuate it rather than it being purely about the love triangle. But the other parts of the triangle are a bit weak as a res- even weaker as a result because it's like, no, I'm really interested in this. The young guy trying to take over the established hands power dynamic that's going on here um but it does kind of put stacy in the position of being a trophy to be one which is frustrating and to again to the show's credit stacy does not accept that role and refuses to be in it r- repeatedly and aggressively um but it's still a little weak as a result albert bumps into william as he finds a wallet at a bar the duo return so just something that i'm going to do is that they assume so many roles throughout the course of the show. I'm just going to say their name. I'm not going to use the aliases that the crew uses. Right, yeah, so much. It's a lot. Um, The duo return the wallet to the owner, who's Mickey. In the bar, we meet, in a different bar, we meet Danny Blue, a short short con artist, who the bartender says, you know, there's Mickey Briggs is back in town. Maybe you could go meet him. And Danny eagerly says, he could be my mentor. Uh. (laughs) Back in the hotel with Mickey, Albert, and William, the two strangers uh, are are thanked by Mickey, who says that since they won't take any money from him, he'll make a a small investment in their name that won't cost them anything as a show of as a show of thanks. It's a it's a no lose situation. Mm -hmm. I'm scrolling through my very expansive note sheet for people that can't. Danny shows up uninvited to the apartment after the other had left. Mickey sends him packing, saying that he doesn't need a new a new sidekick. Strapped for cash, the crew pulls various short cons, including uh, ATM schemes, stealing a luxury car, pickpocketing to earn the cash. The next day, Mickey provides the returns to William and Albert and expresses that there was no risk in this. Mid-con, the door, uh, Danny comes crashing in to help the team. He thanks Mickey profusely, showing that he helped him make a bunch of cash. Mickey quickly adapts to this, and William is fooled completely. After he leaves, Mickey slugs Danny and welcomes him aboard. Yeah. Um, this is one place where I kind of like hustle, one of the many places, I should say, where I like hustle over leverage, in the sense that uh, Leverage is about the intellectual puzzle of the heist, right? It's like, we know the security, um, and these are very competent people with access to a whole bunch of resources, and therefore, it's just clever to see clever people, how they solve that problem, which again, is enjoyable in its own right, don't get me wrong, I enjoy leverage, I still do. But this is about, you do see kind of the logistics of actually putting the con together, 
Mm -hmm. um, and it's little stuff like stay sitting down to cut out the fake blank bills. It's something you just don't see in these other kinds of things, you know, or like we have to get the cash together to then give to the mark. Um, and that's a neat touch of and, and the stress and the strain that puts on the team of them just having to do the logistical shit to get the actual con together is kind of a cool thing to watch. Absolutely. And you also get to see kind of what more of what each of them specialize in. Mm -hmm. How you have Ash doing an ATM bit. You have Albert doing more pickpocketing and you have Mickey stealing cards like it breaks down more into more of the specialty as well. Stacy is back setting up all the different pieces in like the very intricate detailed work still mm -hmm. and also doing the accounting so they know how much money they have. Like it shows you more and more what their lanes are and how why they operate so well together. Right. Um, and I want to call it the ATM scam specifically because it does something that the show at least does through all the episodes we watch. I don't know if the show continues to do this is it showcases actual real world scams. Um, and the ATM scam is actually one of them where, you know, uh, what, what it's kind of, it's kind of fast what's happening there. Um, but ultimately what it does is it kind of glues the ATM door shut. So people will make transactions, think the ATM's broken and move on under the assumption that their transaction was declined because the machine's broken. When in fact, what's actually happening is the machine was deposited, simply not opening the door. And so if you go and pop open that door, then all the previous transactions will also come out because they've been built up inside the, the cage. Um, it is a slightly older version of what happens now where they actually put a, a device on top of the card swipe and steal your data as you swipe it through. So it's your transaction are going through, but then they're also keeping record of the transaction to get and use your credit card information later. Um, so it's an ongoing trend of the show going, no, these are actual scams that, ha that really exist. And we're showing you how they're done in a kind of almost a way to help people protect themselves from said scams. It is nice that you mentioned that because now you gave me an easier segue. When they were coming over to America, the show was so successful. One of the things they did was they put together a show called, oh, what was it? Like Real Hustlers, uh -huh. where you followed these three or five other hustlers as they were going around doing things to show you what real hustlers were. And they promoted it as a way to let people understand what a scam was so they could protect themselves. Oh, nice. Look at that. Look at that. Working together even without knowing it. Um, Stacy steals an ID a D badge, allowing Ash to forge it for Mickey, and the team co-ops a high-rise penthouse office. And there's a, a bit of sexual harassment that we will just skim right over. Uh, everything has been observed by the detectives and sergeants who are waiting to nail everyone at once. Danny distracts the receptionist long enough for William and Albert to go up to the penthouse. The police identify Danny as in his near arrest once in the office. Mickey explains that what they're about to do is foolproof, illegal and lucrative, and there are no victims involved. And they ask William what he wants to do. I'm specifically pausing before the next bit. OK, um, uh, so glossing over the fact that Daniel sex assaults the receptionist, I will say at least one thing that I liked about that scene is it showed how quick thinking he is because he glanced at the desk, sees the romance novel, and then tr and changes his performance to, to continue to distract her while the rest of the team sneaks in. Um, uh, that part hasn't aged well. It's not great. Not going to lie. Uh, but we start to see that Danny has some genuine talent, which is something that up to now he was just, it was constantly being derided as a short con grifter. And everything we saw of him was kind of him uh, blundering in. And, and what we're finding is that the dynamic is Mickey is a planner. Danny is an improver and they both can do both, but that's where their strengths kind of slide on the table. Um, and so it's nice to, it was nice to have a moment where Danny can, genuinely save the con by quick thinking to show that no he's actually a really good at his job and a valuable member of the team i like that then freeze frame and they explain the rules of the con it's a delayed share transaction uh you can assess and buy before stocks go up and in three days vestron an old company will release their information and each of the investors there we have Danny, Albert, and William 
need to invest $100,000. William calls his accountant to double check that Vestron is a real company and agrees to come back with $100,000 in cash. Later at the hotel, Mickey explains the rules of the game and about his dad to Danny. And that Ash and the rest of the crew are all kind of like family. Then he sends Danny home. Albert tells Mickey, he remind Danny reminds him of him. And then Danny asks Albert bluntly, where did you find this kid? Unknown to the team, the police surveillance operation targets Danny as a weak link. And he finds himself, sorry, targets Danny as a weak link. They pull him in. They question him, and in the end, they say that they will let him go free if he provides evidence against the team. Danny finds himself split between remaining loyal to Mickey or surviving and giving them all up to the police. And I'm going to pause there as I'm doing everything out the last bit in one paragraph. Um, uh, the freeze frame, I really dug. And again, like this is, I thought I was going to hate it, but what this is doing is... It's doing a good job of showing you what's in the characters' heads while also explaining to the audience who doesn't have context. Here's some contextual stuff that we as an established con artist team know, but you don't. Um, and also sets up conveniently, or like, well, actually reiterates conveniently the ground rules of the series, which is that we only go after greedy people. Uh, uh, peop you know, Their argument that the con only works if the person is greedy is a bit fallacious you, mm -hmm. lots of people get cons who are not greedy um but for the stakes that they're shooting for they are correct it's like uh, only you know no innocent people get out there because there are plenty of these cons that a honest person it would absolutely fall apart on the like styles of cons they do do fall apart if on, if honest people are the targets and so it sets up an interesting structure for the show which is that by the nature of the fact there's an episode built around this con, the person who they're targeting must inherently therefore be a greedy asshole that needs to be taken down. Um, because if you think halfway, you know, half a second of these cons, all of them fall apart if anyone goes, you know what, maybe I shouldn't risk everything for a little extra money. Uh, uh, so it, again, it helps to kind of cement that we're rooting on the sides of these criminals which is really important to do this two or three times in the pilot because, again, they don't have necessarily a higher motive. They're really just doing it for the money. Um, it's just that their chosen target happen to be people who are even worse than them. And that is – there's a, an underlying layer, though, that if you're distracted by all the glam and glitch of what they're doing you miss is that while they're mark that for, that albert brings in and breaks down to why they're a bad person and why they issue after them is that they're also scamming innocent people like all those people that went to that atm yeah, to get right. their money those are not rich and powerful people maybe the dude that he that mickey stole the car from is, is a rich asshole maybe he's just someone that's good at their job and was taken their third wife out for uh, lunch doesn't right. necessarily mean he's had his car stolen so they are still stealing from other people too right. but the larger scam and target or the larger mark is always a major objective but there is collateral damage here unlike in leverage and burn notice and those shows there is minimal collateral damage to innocent people. Right. And if that damage is done, it's not done by a protagonist. It's done by the antagonist. Yeah. Um, in both uh, Leverage and Burn Notice, uh, the leads uh, explicitly um, refuse reward or take a financial hit in order to fulfill the con. Um, in this case, ostensibly, the financial reward is the whole goal of the crew. Um, over the series, that gets more complicated, and that's what makes the show interesting, right? Like, mm -hmm. this first episode is not the whole package. Like, like, Leverage, Burn Notice, to be honest, once you watch the pilot, you more or less get the format of the show, and then they just evolve from there. This is, no, the whole series is ultimately the lead-in for the entire premise, right? So we're watching six episodes to get to that point where they care about more than just the con, but right here, that's not entirely true, and you're right. They, 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 it's almost a joke that Mickey goes, oh, there's no victim in this crime to the mark. 
because there are plenty of victims in this whole con. Um, but again, the show does a really good job of doing a, a, a montage of the actual uh, 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 victims of the crime to really spread out and luxuriate over, no, this rich asshole is really going to get it, and you're going to love it. Just wait. Oh, God, this guy's going to get so screwed. It's going to be amazing. Just don't pay attention to the other stuff because this guy's really going to get it. I mean, and it's, it, it works. It Frankly, it works. And one of the things is that when he was explaining to Danny on the balcony that I sort of cruised over is that Danny, I think, stresses they could take this guy for a lot more money. And Mickey Renner asked him, it's not about taking all of his money. Right. And right. one of the, the delicate bounces throughout the show that we watch is that frequently they don't take go for all the money frequently. And I use the word frequently for a reason. Yeah. Um, but it's a large sum that would hurt, but also puts people in a situation where they're not going to come after them for it usually. Right. Like that is a delicate balance to do. And that is a great part of the con that he's having to teach to a younger con artist, like during that transition. So it's showing you those generations. Cause we have Albert who's constantly talking to Mickey about how he could be better and how things he could do from what Albert's learned. And Mickey is talking to Danny and somewhat trying to shape him in a very specific way from what he's learned. Right. Yeah. And it establishes that uh, at this point, it's only Mickey. We, we learned that other characters too have a certain kind of moral center. They have a certain code of ethics uh, that they're trying to impart on Danny, who does not have this. Um, but it is a complicated code of ethics. It's not something that's easily articulated. It takes a whole series before Danny fully gets it. Um, and we see the glimmers of that here. Again, we're on the side of the hustle team. But you're, you're right. They kind of gloss over the fact that a lot of people get screwed. Get William and Albert show up together and go up to the luxury apartment with their briefcases full of money in William's case. Uh, Stacy takes the briefcases. You see that William asks, where, where is Danny? And there is a little bit of look of concern that is like quickly masked. A guilt ridden Danny sits in the bar downstairs while the transaction goes is occurring upstairs. Mm -hmm. Danny arrives at the apartment mere moments before the police come crashing in. And you have the police, the new police detective saying, thanks for the lead in Danny. Mickey pulls one of the detective's guns and threatens to kill Danny, shoots and misses. And the police detective shoots Mickey square in the head. And you see a splatter hit the wall behind him. They take out William and they take the cash and everything else. Sometime later, uh, Danny wakes up to the detective saying, all right, can you give me your statement? Danny still refuses to break and discovers that this was all out of itself. Another con inside of the con to test his loyalty. And we discover that the police detective that came in was actually part of the crew who's doing them a favor from out of town. The police uh, can't press any, can't do anything because William doesn't want to press any charges because he doesn't want this to get out. The police themselves are implicated by having provided all their surveillance material to a con artist. And the crew celebrates their victory of $100,000. I'm going to be honest. Um, the detective being a con artist swerve is the my least favorite part of this whole episode. Uh, <laughs> it, it frankly reeks of the writer going, God damn it, I've written myself in a corner. How do I get myself? I don't know. Maybe the detective's also in on it. Um. Everything around it, I liked. Like, I liked the idea of this is a test of loyalty. It's, it's a way to kind of teach the new kids um, what really going on to show that Mickey's a master planner. There's a lot of stuff around that reveal that I actually like. Even the whole faking Mickey's death, I actually, because it's just a kind of over the top that makes sense for a con. Um, but the actual, just out of nowhere, oh, by the way, this guy was on the crew too. He's never mentioned or saw it and all the flashbacks saw with him gave no indication of how this guy from out of town managed to get in town get involved with mickey's crew get on the police force as a detective established as part of this exact case but on off screen they they did to some extent because one of the things that the short recap that i gave is so long is that we start with stacy propositioning someone at the very start of the top of the episode and then the end, we have the police then wondering where that detective is and requesting a fax to that detective. And you get in and you see the person that Stacy 
proposition at the start of the episode is in right, fact that right. detective. <clears throat> right. No. And, and, so and they knew he was coming. They just didn't know what he looked like. <laughs> that is my biggest gaffe with it. Like they, they would have checked something. I assume I'm not a British yeah. police officer, so I don't know. But I'm just... <clears throat> it seems, it seems like when you have a badge, there's a picture that goes with that badge that you can easily look at and go, you don't look anything like this guy. But we've already established that they're great at switching out photos of people. And it's how big it's, is the London? How big is the London Police Force, Eddie? I don't know. I, I'm all cops would not know all cops. I'm not saying that all cops should know all cops. I'm saying is all cops should have a a criminal a database of all other police officers' information, even in two thousand was it two thousand five. Uh, I think it was two thousand two for some reason. That's off the top of my head. I don't remember off the top of my head. It's, it's they're, they're still using faxes and not emails. I just want to stress that right now. Uh, so some of this may come down to the technology. Maybe it's a case where the technology at the time was at a weird point where it would have been plausible and was aired and it quickly rapidly became aged out. I, I'm willing to accept that. Uh, I will just say watching it in 2024, it was like, come on, really? That was the only part <laughs> of the show. I was like, come on, really? Because you're right. They do tie it up at the end. I'm not going to say that they didn't, but there's a lot of off screen like the, the the plan to get him into that task force was way more elaborate than the actual con we saw, and we don't see any of it. That was my point. I, I want to reiterate: they did all this for a hundred thousand dollars, and we talked about victims. That police detective who is sitting in that hotel room this entire time, tied to a bed with an IV, yeah, for like a is week, is a victim. A victim, <laughs> like. Yeah, no, um, but I will say, uh, uh, again, the reason why I'm glad you chose the end to talk about this because it echoes the small stakes of Poker Face, not nearly the same level, right? Poker Space is a very specific, distinctive level of small stakes that I, I really, really dug. But this is also not the constant high stakes of leverage where everything is art theft or millions of dollars on the line. This is just 100 grand, 100,000 pounds. It, it's not a ton of money. And the fact that this Blitz balance ways. Uh, right so you know it's not leverage where the first episode they walk away with three mil each right and then go maybe we we'll do it again this is the there's again they're doing atm scams just to fund this so there's a certain level of balance between the high class cons they're pulling off and the blue collar people that they actually are and are engaging with that's really interesting you know the fact that they constantly meet at eddie's eddie's bar um, you know, that, that there's there's a a groundedness in and in, in hustle that is missing from leverage that I ended up being quite charmed by. And so, yeah, it's it's the yeah, you, you go through all this and they're like and you go, wait, what was that number again? How much did they do this con for? Um, which also shows to the point that a. They're not going to be able to do one big score and walk away, which explains why they're in London for. An implausibly long period of time. Uh, but B, it's it's not for at least this crew. It's not entirely about the stakes. Like like you said, you know, uh, uh, Danny asks the very valid question: Why don't we take this guy for more money? And Mickey Bricks gives a kind of a non-answer. It's not about the money. Okay, but the next logical question is: What is it about Mickey? And he just kind of just doesn't answer because the reality is. It's it's the thrill of the heist, right? The, the con itself is the joy for Mickey and to extension this crew. Well, one of the things they reiterate, I think, as we go through more of the series, is that for them, they consider the con to be an art, like an art right. form in of itself. Yep. And exactly. as artists, I think we can resonate with some of that in of ourselves. Yeah, we don't see it in this episode, but I bring it now because later episodes makes it much more explicit, and I love it. <clears throat> because I can tell you right now, as a, a game designer, it pays me next to nothing. But I still love it. I'm still doing it. Just it's because it is an artistic expression for me that I am passionate about. I, I disagree with you. I mean, I, I have bought a Lamborghini with my uh, money, and, and that Lamborghini is can turn into a robot. Even it's it's about you know. <laughs> well, that's long. because <laughs> you are the well known, incredibly popular, and always in demand. Sir Eddie Webb. I, on the other hand, am sir. a mere a, a pauper, 
a, a person that is just barely getting by looking for scraps of freelance work to come dripping from from the heavens i can't even, i am can't even afford a wheel jack oh my god it's so, so not horrible. even squire <laughs> chris spivey uh, that is how bad it is i i would be a, a peasant chris spivey i'm out yeah. here with my other people sling shoveling shit as i'm seeing king author go by looking for some lady in a lake that's like throwing out swords to people so so what they're just saying is the, the main difference between you and me is i don't have shit all over me basically because you know <laughs> you, you get to be a knight with king author and i'm out here yeah. talking about you guys swanning around looking for ladies in lakes to give you swords stop basically anything, <laughs> anything else before we decide to change this entire podcast to just talking about the holy grail <laughs> or, no, no, I'm not. Which hard end up quoting the Holy Grail because that is what gamers do. <laughs> no, let's move on. All right, season one, episode four: Cops and Robbers. The episode opens with a bank heist, then shifts to Mickey in a cafe having what looks like a lovely cup of coffee in a enjoyable mm-hmm. morning. Until Victor Mayer, a former fraud squad officer and now bank security manager, breaks in to blackmail Mickey into helping him stop a bank robber or risk evidence being leaked to police that would send Danny to prison. Mayor brags about his genius, his love of chest, how he has a 100% conviction rate, and every grifter he's ever encountered has gone to jail, including Albert. While at the hotel, Mickey loses a game of strip poker to Stacy. <laughs> which was great. Um, one thing you glossed over, which I think is great, is... Um, we do see a bank heist, and then the bank robber starts pouring some kind of liquid over the money, which then disintegrates. And so it's like, what the hell is happening here? Um, which is not adequately explained for a good chunk of the episode, actually. Um, I love it. Yeah, no, it's great because it reiterates what this show's about is that it's not – now, even for other people outside of Mickey's team, there are other people for which the crime has – different motives beyond purely financial gain um we learn over the course of the episode what that, what that is i won't go into it now because we'll, i'm sure we'll talk about it but it was a fascinating moment of there's a whole world now there's a whole london scene of criminality that's happening here and again it's reiterated because uh of uh mayor you know how he's like i put all these people behind prison he's kind of this big reverse moriarty of the criminal world that you know he's outsmarted everyone uh, on the law side but he's also such an unrepentant asshole that like within 15 <laughs> seconds i'm like oh, i i know this guy's supposed to hate because he's against mickey but also seriously fuck this guy <laughs> <laughs> so eddie have you played chess do you, do you play, play chess. chess i do play chess do you know that i consider myself to be a pretty good chess player i, mm-hmm. I but i am not thinking that my chess playing skills i could then go and apply to catching bank robbers and outsmarting every single criminal I ever encounter. You you have stumbled on one of my least favorite tropes in fiction, which is the I'm good at chess, ergo I'm good at fill in the blank. Because, you know, humans at best are illogical. I'll, I'll say that. And yes. erratic in their behavior. There is no right. way you can calculate potentially what anyone would do with 100 percent accuracy that's it that's i let the rest of it go well that, that's that's um, the digress but um that was one of the reasons why i loved in uh curse of fenric um where doctor talked about his elaborate chess game with with fenris who's this ancient god and then and halfway through the doctor goes i was playing poker and i'm like that that's right that's the correct way of doing this because chess is a terrible <laughs> fucking metaphor for literally anything unless it's like programming <laughs> Uh, Albert warns Mickey against trying to outsmart Mayor and that they should send Danny away. Mickey disagrees and believes they can keep it a secret. Albert highlights Mickey's biggest flaws, which Mayor is using against him. Loyalty, his massive ego, and hatred of what's being of anyone telling him what to do. Not that I'm going to say that I understand Mickey's biggest flaws. I'll stop there. Um, Mickey <laughs> talks about his father and his as he's in his urge to take on mayor overpowers him after failing to steal the tape from mayor, which was Mickey's first plan. The security head taunts him and explains everything Mickey has to do to ensure the tape isn't sent to police, which is is basically him entering the vault with the robber on camera 
Now left with no choice, Mickey arranges for Stacy to keep Danny occupied and out of the way while he, Ash, and Albert work to set up the robbery. Uh, their their way in with Sam Richards needs is that Sam Richard needs an alarm expert as mayor had his original one nabbed unbeknownst to him. Oh, so one thing I love, and what I realized I love about the show is that in, in leverage and to be fair, burn notice too, um, the scene of someone saying, Hey, here are your flaws and here's how you work around them would eventually be spun by the end of the episode of like, I was aware of my flaws all along and here's how I spun it into my plan. No, no, no. That's not what Mickey does. Albert says, Mickey, here are your flaws. And Mickey immediately goes, yup. And does it anyway. <laughs> like literally. That's what flaws are. <laughs> yeah. Albert's like, here are your flaws. Don't do them. And then Mickey goes, cool. I hear you. What if I did them harder? <laughs> and I love it. <laughs> and from a storytelling perspective, those are great flaws to write for. Someone yes. is incredibly loyal to their team. They have a massive ego. And they hate people telling them what to do. Like those are hands down. Most people automatically identify with those. Yes. Also conveniently happen to be the flaws that most player characters happen to have in every role playing game. What? What? <laughs> the shaw, I say. Um, I personally have an issue with the Danny and Stacy subplot. It's, it leans heavily into a relationship that's not really going to be a relationship, which is Stacy then playing on Danny and like an overly sexy sort of thing that's not sexy. The strip poker game is funny. And like that is where it stops being funny and cool for me for like the tenure of the episode. So. So when I first watched this, I was with you, right? Like, um, like it feels like shit. We need about 50 more pages of script. Let's do this thing. That's what it feels like. Over time, thinking about it, um, it's not entirely unsalvageable, right? Because there is a fair bit of showing Stacy to be a lot more than just Mickey's bit of fluff. Um, it gives her a chance to showcase what she's good at, keep her on screen, and also to show that Danny's starting to learn that there's more to life than just getting a woman in bed and getting some cash at the end of the day. Um, so the intent going on here clearly is to show Stacy as Danny's superior and also to give Danny room to grow as a person, but it does it in the most contrived sexist possible set of plot lines that it's hard to squ I, I can squint past it, but it's really hard to, and I kind of don't want to. It feels for me more like they had an idea. They didn't know what to do with those two characters until the end. Yeah. And so they came up with something I was saying to fill it, but they, I think they should have pulled a Nissa on Kinder where Nissa falls down and takes a nap for the entire episode. Stacy and Danny should have had something. So they were just out of the episode until the very end where they were needed. Yeah. Because wow, again, well, I can squint past it. I still can't get over the fact that ultimately what happens and Mickey's like, Danny's kind of annoying me. Could you please so go seduce him for a few days so he stops bothering me? Because that's basically what happens. I, I give it a bit more that he needs him out of the way to pull the con, but it's, yeah. And even when they're like doing their stuff and she's constantly checking her watch too, which then goes back and reinforces and an old stereotype that I'm not a big fan of. And so it's, yeah. all right. Right. No, it. Uh, honestly, it should have been the, listen, you need to fucking go away for a few days. So we're going to get a hotel room. We're going to, we're going to, you're going to sit there and you're going to play cards. You're going to like it. And Stacey's going to keep an eye on you, but she's not going to try and seduce you. Right. There could have been a different way to solve these problems. And, and even then having Mick or having uh, uh, Danny continually trying to flirt with Stacey and bouncing off of the, the, the iron wall that is Stacey, who's not, cause she's like, my, my frustration is she starts to say, I don't sleep with people in my crew. Then very much implies that she's going to sleep with Danny only to reiterate at the end. It's just cruel, frankly. And it leans into the stereotype that you can wear you, someone down to be. Right, yes, if I keep you, trying hard enough, she'll sleep endurance. with me. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it. it doesn't. Both, both characters come out of it worse as a result, which is frustrating. All right. Um, anything else about that? I will, I will stop 
harping on that point. I made uh, it. Oh, uh, I want to go back a little bit um, to the um, – because I, I, I didn't finish my thought, and it was just because I stopped halfway through and didn't continue. Um, was uh, – I mentioned about the, you know, uh, Mickey just kind of doubling down his flaws. And one thing I love is the fact is the, the, the tape heist because it does two things really well. Um, one, it, allow, it it Mickey loses, which is actually good. For drama it, it's the it's not this is part of his plan all along no he genuinely straight up loses and, and the show you know makes that clear they lost um but also it does something that these shows tend to sometimes forget is that this is the shortest path why not just do the shortest path <laughs> uh because i don't know how many times i've watched these shows like why don't they just steal that thing and be done with it You're right they're they're literally thieves and so the shows like let's just steal a tape back great oh he planned for that because that's the really obvious thing to do. So it doesn't have to paint this guy as a mastermind because, like, that's the first thing I would have planned against too. But it's, it's like let's just try the obvious thing and see what happens. And by tying that to Mickey's ego and saying, "Of course, I can outsmart this guy by doing the obvious thing," and then no, well, copies you you can't do the obvious thing because the guy's planned for at least that much is actually good. It, it does elevate both of their characters, which is in stark contrast to the other characters simultaneously being de-elevated <laughs> in the subplot. I'm glad you brought that up because it does also point out that Mare has a massive ego and yep. his ego is so huge that he has not made a copy of the tape. Like That's that is an incredibly point. important point. Like He's playing with his own set of morals and values which you do not expect from someone that, well, let me rephrase that, that most people don't expect from someone who's supposedly on the right side of the law. Well, that's actually a really good point I hadn't quite thought of, but Mickey and Mayor have the exact same flaws. Yeah. And I hadn't thought about that until you said it, but you're right. And Mickey eventually realizes these are my flaws, but they're also his flaws. We don't see that on screen, but that's kind of how the plan is shaped. It's like, okay, what would I, how would I defeat myself? And that's kind of what he does. Which is interesting. That's really cool, actually. Because they even go so far as to call Mayor Moriarty literally for this. Yeah. For yeah. Albert, not necessarily for Mickey, but you can see some of those parallels. And that was mm -hmm. a nice touchstone. Yep. Um, Albert hooks up with Sam and connects him to Mickey, who will play a fixer. While Stacy and Danny are floaters, Ash studies alarm systems in numerous comical scenes. Uh, <laughs> Danny and Stacy lark about flirting, and she shares her dreams with him. And they play out one of Danny's desires to pull off an old school con. And you know, I'm going to stop here because okay. when I was watching this episode, I literally stopped and rewound. Am I watching the same show? Did I fall asleep for five minutes because I was tired? No, no. They just jumped directly into this. All right. As much as stick as I gave this subplot, I actually kind of love this uh, in the sense that the dog con is a genuine con that happens, right? Um, and, and this is something I, I mentioned earlier is that the shows actually take a pain to say these are actual cons that happen. Danny's – I've always wanted to do an old school con. That's kind of a bit eye-rolling, but it points to your earlier point is that Danny's starting to realize he cares less about – the result of the con and more about the art of the con. Um, and as an artist, sometimes you want to revisit the favorites that worked really well for the artistic pleasure of it. Yep. And the, but them shooting it as a silent film was like this extra level of what the fuck that makes me not entirely hate that subplot. And it goes back to like that con must be, I didn't research the con, but it must be so old that that's around the time frame where it would have been effective and worked is my thought. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, as I understand it, um, that con was done primarily the, 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 the original resonance was that it was around the time when, uh, you could also get a room at a, a pub like that. And so it was like, Hey, watch this dog. I'm going to go, you know, upstairs. Then this whole thing happens and it comes back. Um, uh, uh, you know, or I'm gonna get a why I'm gonna get a telegram from my bank manager. Oh, the telegram said blah blah. Um, uh, so, but but yeah, I mean, it's it's a legitimate con that happens. Uh, we see another one of those actually uh, next episode too. Um, uh, but it's it's a neat little touch of like the writers also themselves care to a degree about the art of the con, as you will. Uh, they've done some research and, and and they showcase this stuff and it's like look at look at the 
get pleasure in this. But again, the other thing about this is to earlier point. Um, I mentioned how the show sets up very carefully that people who are not greedy don't get fooled by this. And this is a perfect example of that. If the bartender, because okay, we go over this really quickly, con comes there too. Guy comes in with a dog, says it's a very, uh, a dog that makes, raises a lot of money. He goes off. Woman comes in and says, I want to buy that dog for a bunch of money. Give this guy my number. She leaves. Guy comes back, says, the bank won't pour my loan. The guy, the bartender offers to buy the dog. And then he can then theoretically resell it to um, the woman who came into it. Reality, guy's been conned out of the money he gave for the dog. Dog's not even there. It's blah, blah, womp, womp. This all gets shortcut if the bartender goes to the guy and says, here's the number of the woman who wants to buy your dog. Maybe she'll sell it to you, sell it to you and they can get the money that way. And because he's honest, the con falls apart, but no one gets hurt. So the, yeah. someone only gets hurt if the person's genuinely a greedy asshole. And that is – why this works because that's the art of it is it only hurts people who are themselves trying to screw somebody else they're trying to screw somebody else and therefore themselves get screwed that is why the art is attractive because the the the, the act becomes simultaneously uh, a vengeance and payoff which another i guess not even subtle part of that but if you notice when he comes back in distraught since it's silent film, you don't know if he told, I think I can't remember if they told him about the bank manager first or not, but the bartender gives him a free drink before he does that. Yeah. And alcohol in itself is something that sort of like helps, it supposedly impairs your decision-making process, which makes mm -hmm. it easier to convince him to do that. Yep. To like mm -hmm. sell his dog. So. I still, I understand you like it. Subplot still bothers me. I don't know. Ah. No, I, how they got there was frustrating. That actual scene was fun. Mickey, who after meeting with Sam, discovers that the robber is seeking revenge on the bank for bankrupting his family and causing his father, who reminds him of his own father, who we've discussed previously, to commit suicide as a result. Sam doesn't want the money, just the jewel the bank, the bank stole from his family, the jewel that is family gave to the bank to hold for their loans and once even though they were paid the bank never returned it meanwhile stacy and daniel continue to bond wow. she tells him about her husband the scam they used to run and how her husband stole all their money and that mickey helped her in the end mayor sends a videotape of albert begging him to leave mickey alone and he angrily confronts his mentor albert and mickey have a heart to heart about what Mickey's doing, and then he realizes Mayor has set him up to go down, and if it works, he's entrapped with the robber. With Albert's help, the two realize that they have an ace up their sleeve to beat Mayor, and they inform the team of everything that's going on and bring them fully into the plan. Right. Uh, stay still, plot, blah, boring. Um, when the Albert tape showed up, I was convinced this was part of Mickey's plan. And it's not. And I like it better knowing that. Mm -hmm. Albert genuinely tried to beg Mayor to leave him alone. Mayor said, fuck you, up the stakes, and tried to put Mickey in a box. And I'm super glad because at the end of this episode, again, I'm trained from leverage to think all this part's all planned and we see the plan. You know, the whole episode snaps into focus. Again, there's a joy in that. But in this case, no, it's – these people genuinely care for each other, and because they are con artists, they will white lie to each other in what they think is that person's interest. We do have a sub the, – the, the subplot of Danny is that Mickey ostensibly is not telling him because he doesn't want him to get caught, and so he's doing, he's doing all this behind Danny's back to save him. And so we see a parallel of that – of Albert doing the exact same thing and failing – and Mickey kind of realizing, oh, that's kind of what I'm doing to Danny. So there's a lot of really good stuff happening here. It's again, this it involves Danny and Stacey having me sideline, which for frustrating reasons. But I like the fact that not everything is an elaborate plan. Mickey is a is good. He's a mastermind, but he's not omnipotent. And I really surprisingly, I was I was surprised by my reaction at how much I, I appreciated that. Mickey is a genuinely interesting character not a plot device to structure fun heists around yep and i love every second of it 
Mm-hmm. And it also goes back to how generational the show is from even from your example, where we have the grandfather to teach the father, the father to teach the son. And you see mm-hmm. each of them learning different things and applying different skills. And it is a wonderful thing to watch as it's what a family does. And it, oh, yep. mm-hmm. it is it is weird to be talking about Hustle, a show about swindling people and talking about the family dynamic in it and how point on it is. But it's so good. It, it is how found family should be. Uh, anything else about that piece? Nope. So, with the plan in mind for phase one during the day, Albert in disguise cause a distraction in the bank. <laughs> I I hate and I love it so much, but I it do. is it is beautiful to watch. I'm gonna drop a whole bunch of pound coins on the ground and then go get through. Oh god, it's so bad and it's so good. Allowing Ash and Sam, who have come in disguise, to steal an ID badge. You, the two of them enter a secured area and do some sort of drilling that we're not sure of yet. Meanwhile, Mayor is pre- prepping his security team to capture them later that evening when they perform the heist. For phase two, later that evening, Albert will meet with Mayor to receive the tape. And when it starts to occur, we see that Sam and Mickey pull up. Albert and Mayor are watching them on the camera. And as they're about to break into the vault, suddenly smoke appears, filling the room. Mayor is shocked. He and his security team, after giving the tape to Albert, rush down to where the vault door should be. In the, and when they get there, there was no smoke at all. Instead, they notice that there is a weird lead and they follow that lead to another room and they see the video feed itself has been rerouted to another location. The security team and Mayor sprint off towards that location and they discover that there is a faked vault door, a mini toy size fake do- vault door set up, a smoke thing in disguise. And while they're there, Mayor realizes they've left the vault unattended and they begin to rush back to the bank. In disguise, two security guards unmask to see Stacy and Danny in disguise. They steal back the diamond and you see Danny has a, a crisis of faith because he wants to steal cash and Stacy's saying, we need to leave now. Back outside with the rest of the team, they give the diamond to Sam Sam and Mickey become lifelong eternal friends bonding over past trauma. And the team goes back to the hotel. The once at the hotel, they taunt Danny a little bit about not taking the cash. And then (laughs) Stacy pulls out a stack of fat bills for all of them. And then Danny pulls out a stack of cash for where three socks would have kept his socks from his trousers (laughs) to show that he in fact did steal some money as we end on the gift they gave mayor an opera singer outside singing a song <laughs> i rephrase it because i don't like the phrasing i know body shaming right but it is a common phrase for when something is officially done and i do appreciate that um i was watching this and going why does this plan feel familiar and i realized a good chunk of this plan is basically the second david job <laughs> And I have to wonder if Leverage intentionally homaged this episode with the second David job. I would think so. You know that the Leverage team had to have watched Hustle. Had to have. Had to have. And I wonder. I think they make a joke about it in one of the episodes too. Like a line like someone's the best team across the Atlantic or something. Oh, that's amazing. So they. Yeah. Because the, the, the whole. Um we're going to fill a place with smoke as a way to get you to rush into a room to be in the absolute wrong place while we do something else entirely. That's the structure of the second David job. And I was just like, that's actually, I actually kind of dug that. Right. It's, it's like, I, I like the fact that they're riffing off of each other's structure in that way. Um, but it did leave me with going, but I like this version better. Um, <laughs> partially because the second David job, the entire episode was the con. And this is just, no, Mickey genuinely has fucked up a couple of times, but this is the final moment. Um, I am a little suspicious that this chess playing mastermind somehow didn't extrapolate his castling skills to figure out that someone maybe changed the video feed. Uh, <laughs> but whatever, you know, I, don't, I almost don't care because the emotional catharsis of, yeah, this guy finally got his is all that really matters to me. I would... Then go and account that to go back to the ego that Mayor has because you're unlike right, you're right. Mickey, he doesn't have an Albert to constantly try to ground him and let him know this is a flaw. That Mayor has none of that. All Mayor has is his own ego that has gotten greater and greater with every victory over Mickey. 
and right. like that glee of excitement that I'm about to arrest you. Well, combined with the fact that also um, the, the the conceit of this episode, uh, which is played out, is that Mickey's strength is his team and Mayor doesn't have a team. Uh, and so the fact that they have a team is what gives them the advantage. So, I mean, I'm not mad about it. It's more of – it's kind of a eh, but then I don't care because you're right. Like that he's – Mickey's playing to Mayor's flaws effectively. I didn't think of this. Ergo, Mickey Bricks could not possibly have thought of it. When in fact, Mickey Bricks absolutely thought of it because his team helped him to get there. And we have that reinforced because Mayor himself, at a, in one of his meetings with Mickey, says that something like, "There's nothing you could have think, nothing you could think of, I haven't already thought of." Right. Like that was one of his off lines to like constantly poke at him to rile him up more and more. Yeah. Um. Any last minute comments about this one? Uh, uh, I want to talk about the credit scene. I need to talk about the credit scene. I know. That's why I was like, <laughs> maybe I'll move on to any best. <laughs> Okay. All right. So uh, the credit scene, um, unlike other episodes where you just get credits, in this case, we do have a small 30 second scene of Stacy buying a bag of crisps. And it is, I spent half an hour obsessing about this um, because ultimately it is what is known as the, the quick change scam. Uh, and basically the, the basic, uh, let me break it down because this is, I love this. Uh, so how, how it happens is Stacy goes to Eddie who runs the bar to buy a 50 pounds Oh, sorry, 50 pence packet of crisps. She has a 10 pound note. She gives the 10 pound note. Bartender gives her 50p. She walks away. He says, wait a minute. Let me give the rest a change and gives her four one pound coins and a five pound note. So she says, oh, wait, I have a, a pound coin. So give me a 10 pound note back and I'll give you a five note and five coins. So you have change for the till. Great. So, so basically they change the money back again. So uh, Stacy now has the pound she started with and along with 50p and five crisps. The bartender's like, wait, you only gave me nine pounds. And then she's like, oh, okay, how about this? How much do you have? You have nine. I have 11, so let me give you that, and you give me a 20-pound note. And so he goes, okay. And so they change it back again. And then he goes, wait a minute, did you try something funny? And she goes, no, and blinks at the camera, so we know she did. The reason why I love this is that if you break it down mathematically, there's no con. Right. If you actually do the math of like how much each person has gotten, it tracks out. So I'm like, how in the fuck did this work? I know this is a scam. I know it's a common scam, but I've never actually dug into completely how it actually works. And it breaks my brain because this is something that only works with physical currency. You have to look at what actually happens here. She has a 10 pound note. She gives him the 10 pound note and he gives her some change. Again, also 50p in a packet of crisps. That's just part of the grift. She gets that for free. Hooray. Um, <laughs> I love that. I love that. Again, stupidly low stakes. I have scanned a packet of crisps. I love that. Um, but so basically what happens is he has nine pounds. She has 10 pounds. She gives him 10 pounds. No, he gives her nine pounds back. And then she goes, wait a minute. And they ultimately switch back. And then she goes, I'll give you this and a pound for a 20 pound note. It's the same 10 pound note. She's fortunately paying for it again. She basically uses the same 10 pound note twice. And that's how she gets 20 pounds or 20 pounds, 50 and a packet of crisps at the end of it. On a mathematical level, she has lost 11 pounds, 50. I mean, so ultimately, I mean, she's she, she paid the correct amount. And so as a cashier, if you do the actual maths, yes, that that's how it should go. But that's not what's actually happening because there's a 10 pounds, extra 10 pound note that mathematically doesn't exist. It's 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 so brain breaking. It, it it should not work that way. You have you have to really rethink the whole thing to understand what actually happened because she genuinely walks away ten pounds richer and has a snack. It's it's wild. It's wild, and yet you can't really explain it. Like I wrote it down four times. Chris maybe even saw me in the document four <laughs> times. I had to write this down. It's like wait no. There's no scam there, but there has to be a scam because the show has told me there's a scam. So what's the scam? It's because she paid. She used the ten pound note twice, <laughs> but it's bonkers. But, and, and, but the thing I love about it is that's a casual thing, but it shows that there's an entirely different kind of scam, which is this is a scam that relies on mathematical uncertainty. Um, another example that game designers are more familiar with is the Monty Hall paradox. Mm. Um, very quickly, uh, there's a show called Let's Make a Deal. The premise is there are three doors. You see one door, 
You can see what's behind it. You could choose what's behind it, or you could pick one of the other two doors, but you have to take whatever's behind the other two doors. Uh, casually, anecdotally, it seems like you have a 33% chance of getting something better by going to the other door. Mathematically, it's actually always statistically better to choose a different door. You will actually net more if you always change. And I have seen lengthy papers trying to explain this to me, and I still <laughs> do not understand it. But it is mathematically sound. And to the point where that's where a lot of things like loot boxes actually cause problems because the loot box will open up something really good and say, but you can get something bigger and people will always change to it. But if you change the math underneath of it, it you can actually make it statistically worse, even though we feel like we have a better chance. Gambling also relies a lot on this, on the way where the casual person, how they do the math and how uh, the mathematics actually work are distinctly different. That's why gambling works the way it does. This is a variation on how gambling works, but it, it takes really rethinking the whole thing to understand why it works that way. And it's just crammed in this credit scene. This highly intricate, mathematically complicated scam is done as a gag. And that is this whole fucking show. <laughs> and in addition to what, what Eddie said, and Eddie has like a page of notes about this. Um, <laughs> it plays to the strength that we've established for Stacy that this would be her type of con to run. Yep. She is the accountant for the team. Yep. And it is an accounting based scam. Right. And it really reinforces the fact that we saw earlier is is that they don't do it because they need she doesn't need a packet of crisps and a 20 pound note, right? She does it because that's what she loves doing. And it also, it's a great character moment because the bartender can't explain what happens, but he knows something happened. He knows the kinds of people he, he has in his bar. So it's like, wait a minute, was there something funny there? There's actually character building in this, and I want to reiterate this, a credit scene. <laughs> No one needed this scene to exist except for me, apparently. I apparently needed this scene to exist. Part of me thinks it could also be they didn't know if they're going to get a second season or not Sure. at this point. So mm -hmm. they want to get in all their good bits now, which is yep. something else I want to reinforce for anyone that's making anything. Put in all your good bits up front because you yeah, may you not know. get a second shot. Like, never don't know. save them. Put them up front and then deal with that problem later if you're super successful. It's like, shit, I don't know what I'm going to do now. But you have a now to figure that out with. Um, final thoughts before we move on to the last episode. Let's get to the last one. Thank you for taking the time to write about that 30 second sequence. I was really obsessed with it. I think you would have been a little ranty if we hadn't bought through that. <laughs> well, no, I would talk about this thing because the mathematics. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Season one, episode six, the last gamble. We open with Mickey and Danny wrapping up a grift on a corrupt developer who's paying them 25 K to buy the London eye. <laughs> Albert. Back at the hotel, back at the hotel, Albert then breaks down their current target, Sir Anthony Reed, or as I would say, Sir Eddie Webb. Um, I'm not the rest of this doesn't apply to Eddie, but it was a good gag for me. Uh, a xenophobic, <laughs> corrupt former CEO, one percenter with a horse racing and sex worker addiction who just received a half a million dollar payout despite poor mismanagement of a utility company he worked at. Mickey decides to use a modern day version of the wire scam. Eddie, do you want to break down what the wire scam is? Uh, I do, but I also sometimes want to touch on. But I'll, I'll do the wire scam. So the wire scam basically is uh, again another old scam, where um, horse racing results back when they were passed by telegram uh, uh, and later even radio. I think uh, they would move from the east coast to the west coast, uh, and so as a result, uh, there was a delay when the horse race was finished in the east coast to where the results would actually show up on the west coast. So. The scam is that they would intercept the transmission and then uh, place a bet in the West Coast, knowing the results before the results are officially announced, so that they can therefore get guaranteed results from horse racing. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to mention uh, is this is super weirdly timey, uh, because um, just now in uh, the UK, uh, there is a post office scandal going on. There's a huge deal um, uh, where they'll have the post office uh, punished a lot of what you know sub uh, they're called sub postmasters um uh and basically just let a bunch of them go for no reason whatsoever due to ultimately 
came out to computer errors and basically fired a bunch of people as a result of it. Uh, this person, she was knighted for her work as the postmaster um, and has now uh, has rescinded that title over the controversy. It was like a uh, – there was there was a drama movie made of it that was broadcast on the BBC. Um, so wow. someone being the head of the utility, uh, being fired over it and then getting paid a whole bunch of money as a result is really timely right now. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Now, now, I have questions, but I'll ask you probably some. No, yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah. All you guys get is like, oh yeah, there's flooding in London. It's like, oh, there's other interesting stuff happening here. <laughs> uh, any other comments on this piece before we move on? Just, just the fact that I love the fact that they, based short of if, if they had sold him London Bridge, is the only way they could have made that <laughs> I'm selling someone a bridge <laughs> scam any clearer. <laughs> um. Since you did mention that, I did like the fact that we opened at the end of a grift here. I know the grift is going to be important later for the plot, yeah. but it was a nice change of pace. In the show itself, I think realizes that it needs to start varying up things or else it's going to get tired very quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Then we have a mysterious person is trying to connect with Danny, who still feels like an outsider to the group. Albert and Danny set the lure for Reed. Danny pretending to have a connection that will ensure winning a horse race. Reed is instantly curious. Reed trash talks those with less money than him and mentions the fool buying the London Eye as Albert drops the name of, the, of a winning horse that Stacy provided him. Reed nibbles at the bait and requests a meeting with Danny. Danny faces a tough decision when another grifter, Scottish Ray, offers him a chance to run with his, run with his new crew. At the same time, unbeknownst to the crew, a previous Mark is seeking payback against Mickey and Danny and is going to kill him. Danny brings Stacy to meet with Reed and admits to working for a syndicate that buys racing horses. And Stacy is a high-class escort who overhears tips from his bosses. Reed is hooked. Ash fully arranges for a cash-only private gentleman's club to be created and the team... Has plan is set in motion. I haven't talked a lot about Ash, but Ash yeah. is kind of the backbone of the show throughout all these. He's making everything happen. And yep. it's one of the things, even anywhere, like you have someone who's just the worker, basically, yep. who is essential, but they don't get a lot of the glam that the other characters get. So I want to take a moment to talk about Ash, who set up like the first in the first episode where Mickey gets killed. You see him in the background with like two watermelons. That right. you don't know what's that going to do, <laughs> and all the planning that he has to do throughout the entire course of the show is yep. spectacular. He's this is going to sound dismissive, but I don't mean it to be. But he's basically the stagehand, right? He's the guy behind the scenes of the play who makes sure all the tech works, makes sure everything's put up the right way. Um, he makes sure this, 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 everything looks right, everything sounds good. Um, and, and that's what he's doing, and that's his role in the team. And you're right, Ash is fantastic. Um, even though there was the joke about um, him not knowing how to disarm alarms, it, it, it showed something else, which is like, I, I'll open a book and I'll learn it. That's what that's what I do, right? I'm the guy who gets things done, and he builds an entire gambling club. And as you talk about the alarm, that was like a world-class alarm system that – he figured out because he's like i know alarms but then he had to learn that new set of alarms anyone who's done anything knows yeah. that, like tech and things evolve and you have to work to catch up so that was mm -hmm. beautiful to see i love the character and how they're doing it in the background i just want to give a minute to give him a shout out right i also did like in the briefing um where he's like you know uh albert's like he's got like two things which is high cast high class escorts and they stop at states he goes oh no please no and they're like no no it's cool we're laying the, we're laying the horse racing um, she does end up falling in a kind of similar role anyway, uh, but because of the previous episode, again, we, we were down on the subplot, but she was like, I did do a stint as pretending to be a, pro, a, a sex worker, um, and it's clear she's like, I'm done with that. I don't want to keep doing that scam. And so the team's like, nope, you're uncomfortable with that, so we'll do the other thing. I, I really – it's a small moment, but I dug the fact it's like s someone in the team, a woman, expressed her agency and her discomfort with a topic, and the team just quietly moved to a different thing super cool yeah and i i want to make sure though while we're saying that that the character doesn't want to do it and the team has decided not to do that 
I, as a person, think that sex work is great and they are incredibly sure. hard workers and should be treated with respect and should have legalized health care. That's a whole other discussion that we can have later. Absolutely but agree. I want to make sure that we also advocate. Well, I'm going to advocate that like that is my belief and I'm glad the show did that. But I also want people to understand like that. There's a there's a nuance there and I want to. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I'm, I'm completely with you. Like sex work is work and I'm completely behind that. We're not trying to shame that. Rather, the fact is that um, very often in these kinds of environments, if a woman expresses her discomfort uh, in, a, in an area that she does not want to be involved in. She's often pressured into go ahead and doing that work anyway. In this case, she was like, I would I would, I would prefer not to do this work. And they said, cool. That's fine. We, we figured you didn't. We're going to do this other thing anyway. And so while she still ends up filling the role of an escort is purely decorative and not involve the actual work that she is just inclined to do. Yeah. She acts more as a plant that is providing information. Yeah. And you also get to see more of her skill set as she's like doing a lot of the research and everything else around providing information to the rest of the team. So once that, again, oh, I right, love that, that, showing their skills. Yeah, that's uh, the other reason why I like this is because it would a lazier writer would have been like, and then she's the like, pretty girl sleeps with the guy. Huh? Again, there's something that I mentioned a little frustrated with the leverage thing is because the sexy Connor is just always sexy Connor. She's like, yes, I have that bag in my repertoire, but I have other skills. And this episode goes, while she does do that role, look at all the other stuff she's doing as part of this column. So yeah, no, Stacy is by far the winner in this episode in terms of how her character gets redeemed. And I haven't seen much of it, but I think in Leverage Redemption, the more modern version of Leverage, they have, I forgot her name now, but she played Jane in Coupling as the mastermind replacing Nate. Okay, cool. Since they killed off that character and his problematic stuff. Um, potentially Good. alleged problematic stuff. Let me right. phrase that properly. Uh, anything else about this before we move on? I know that we're we're clipping through this one, but we're also... Yeah, no, that's fine. Along. At the club. Danny walks Reed around, who comments about no press. Mickey is smug to Reed, getting his goat. The pair bet a large sum and went, unbeknownst to him, clearing out the team's current cash supply. Back at the gentleman club, Danny and Stacy push Reed to go big next time, as they don't know how many more tips they'll get. Reed throws the team a curveball as he wants one more bet to ensure the system works before going too big. Mickey's upset, but alters the plan. The next day, when Reed arrives, he misses placing his bet by mere seconds, but the horse he was told still wins. Enraged, Reed leaves with Danny and intends to come back and bet again tomorrow. I I like this because, again, it's a case of um, Mickey has a plan for everything. And also, sh uh, again, they, they don't have infinite resources. Um, so the fact that they don't have cash is a, is a wrinkle in the plan. Um, and rather than going, okay, let's tip smart ATMs, make this work. It's okay. No, let's find a way to get him the proof he needs. And again, to Danny's credit, Danny is the one who spins his outrage into, no, let's take these guys, let's, let's take these guys for all they're worth. Let's, let's pay a huge bet, take all their money. He spins that outrage into getting him back into the con, the mark back into the con, um, because they could not have prepared for that reaction. Uh, so M Mickey had the plan, and he was able to alter the plan quickly. He's able to improvise the plan, but he still has a plan. Danny was able to go, okay, I, in this moment, can spin this conversation in the right direction to get the mark back on track. So it was a good – after six episodes, we see that now their respective skills complement each other are not, in fact, con in conflict with each other. Which is a great evolution of the characters themselves and mm -hmm. what happens if you're working on a team. Like, yep. that is crucial. Um, anything else? Since we're running long, I'm going to, I'm speeding yeah, up a little bit yeah, let's, let's get the rest of this. Albert and Stacey plead with Mickey not to smother Danny and trust him more. Danny turns down Scottish Ray again. The next day we see Danny and Stacey con Reed into betting half a million dollars at the syndicate as it is under police surveillance. And this will be the last race. When Reed tries to bet, Ash makes a huge deal about it being too much money and Reed's pressures him saying it's not. Mickey comes in and approves. Reed bets it all as Stacy told him to and said, place, not win. And when Reed discovers that, he rushes back to try to get his money back. And Mickey tells him that what he saw happen is Reed lose. Reed is upset. But before he can do anything, I want to try to remember since I am tired now, just hit me. Um, Reed rushes out as, a, as someone from the press 
says, hey, aren't you Sir Reed? Is this what you're doing with all right. the people's money? And Reed rushes out trying to escape, having lost half a million dollars. Which specifically right. is the exact amount that he was given in his golden parachute after his CEO job. It's funny how that worked out. Mm -hmm. um, and before, while the team is celebrating, one of the televisions explodes. It in comes a first Mark who's determined to kill them, kill Mickey and Danny, but instead says, you know what? I'll just take the money you stole from the last Mark. Thinking quickly, Danny causes a fight with Mickey about how much they actually pulled phony money and the two get into a huge argument and in the end the previous mark leaves with a case full of the phony money and the team escapes and we end with them going on a vacation talking to the camera about their new half a million dollars they just got yeah um uh, uh so uh it, it, i love this ending um it, it's fantastic uh the It's it's a nice every there's lots of stuff that happens in the beginning and and to be fair the the first half to two thirds of the episode feels like it's a bunch of stuff is just happening and it's like what is going on with this and then with the exception of the um uh other con artists trying to poach Danny um well, actually no that that also has to it all kind of collapses and and ties together at the end um but it's not this was mickey's plan all along again I, I keep coming back to that but it's really important it's rather the team pivoted to tie this all together uh and the episode so the episode is actually very well structured but it's not the team is not equally well structured the team is a bit messy and a bit human and i love that because it's uh the con naturally comes to a conclusion. It's a pretty straightforward conclusion, uh, uh, all things considered. It's it's the we start off going him being pounded by press, and then if you said earlier, ah, there's no press in the club. Turns out there's a reporter at the club, and so playing on that uh, and, and tying it all together, um, because it's not again about the money, not the half a million dollars per se. It's about the fact that he was seen to have lost this money and was taxpayer money. That was the big point. Uh, but then in all of this, we see Danny potentially uh, coming around to what Mickey's trying to do while Mickey's also coming around to giving Danny a little more of his head, as it were, uh, which has been an ongoing thing with the, the story. And then, like you said, the, the first Mark coming back and just being a straight up gangster. And it's like, I'm going to just murder you people unless you give me some money. Uh, and then the fight between Danny and Mickey. Oh, it's so good. Um, well, it, it looks like an act, you know, some of it is real, too, between, like, at least from the character perspective, that it's real between those two and their own inner things. Yeah. Oh. It, it reminds me, you're going to hate me for this, it reminds me of wrestling. Uh, because um, there's a fair number of wrestling, uh, port, uh, so the difference between uh, what's called a work and a shoot. Uh, shoot is um, this, what's happening on screen is real, work is what's happening is plans. Uh, which leads to the natural conclusion of a worked shoot, uh, which is something real has happened and they turn it into a storyline. Uh, so um, as a random example, um, one wrestler uh, who shall remain Jeff Hardy uh, has been <laughs> repeatedly hit with drug violations. And so a wrestler come on, on TV to talk about his arrests for uh, driving while drunk as part of an angle to get them into a fight. And that's what this felt like, right? It felt like there was genuine heat between the two of them. And half the conversation is them actually having the conversation supposed to have. And half the conversation is Danny trying to tell Mickey, go with me on this without actually making it obvious because there's a gun pointed at them. And then watching Mickey's slow realization of what the story is and then playing along with it is beautiful because there's no – because of the nature of it, there's no aside. They could have done a freeze frame here, honestly, and talk to you. I didn't say, here's what's happening, but they don't. And it was great they didn't because it's all in the facial expression and the acting that we slowly realize, okay, no, Mickey's that you got it now. Um, and so weirdly, it's the punch that is the turning point. When Mickey punches him, you know as the audience, Mickey's doing it because it's the plan, 
not because he's angry, but it's like moments before the punch where you as the audience, at least where I saw that that was actually happening. And it's so well done. It's purely down to the writing and the actors and to a degree of cinematography, but most of the writing the actors that are carrying that in a very subtle way. And I was like, okay, I now see why people love this show because this is fantastic. Absolutely. And I think, at least for me when I was watching, I think it's when Danny says it's like 60K that we got, that's when it hits Mickey fully and he's fully on board yep. with the plan. Because yep. they mm -hmm. know how much it really is. And like that sort of shows you that, ah, got it. Let's do this. And right. that constant dynamic and shifting, which goes back to why I think Adrian Lester would have been a fantastic doctor. Um, <laughs> right. It, it's it's a, a nice display of like all their skills and talents, but also at the same time, I want to take a moment that we go back to have a shot of Sir Reed sitting at home, knowing he lost half a million dollars and his wife asking him how his day was like, that's a nice yes. comical touch on it to end with the crew and Albert saying he's going to retire because we start the series with Mickey saying he's going to retire. And instantly yep. Albert hears something and they're like, do you need me to hold your drink for you while you go do this thing that you're to do? It's showing <laughs> me that they're coming back. Like they have no intention. It is an addiction to doing this art. For yep. all of them. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and again, like you were saying before, um, three socks in the background kind of playing the, the, the croupier or the, um, the, the person managing the bets, uh, which is great because doing little things like, you know, are we sure your boss or, you know, I didn't count it. Um, little things that help to sell that con, which aren't the broad strokes of the plan, but the little details of the plan that he's filling in is, is just great. Any closing thoughts on hustle or this micro run of episodes that we've done that we have? Uh, I mean, I've already said a lot of, of the micro run um, as for hustle. This is one of those times where, much like uh, you with uh, Peacemaker, it was like I haven't really heard about this much about this show, um, and I watched it, and I'm so glad I did, uh, uh, um, and I'm super glad that all eight series are on BBC iPlayer because um, I'm, I'm definitely going to watch, watch this at some point now um, because this is uh, this is everything. This is such a great capstone, right? Uh, it was everything I loved about the previous episodes we watched. And it's like, oh, it's just dead on. It's just one show it, it, it's all the emotional stuff from something like uh, poker face it has some of the um more interesting structural stuff of, of poker face it has the uh, uh emotional beats of something like um uh burn notice and then the the fun puzzle making of how do they get away with it uh in leverage all kind of wrapped up into one so this has been just a great little arc of Something that's not even remotely Doctor Who, but yet it was just a cool little thing that, again, I think otherwise we never would have probably gotten to. And I in, in agreement. And one of the things that will that I want to say that I almost forgot. Thank you for mentioning Burnos again. Is that the characters feel more like their characters from Burn Notice? Yeah, because they are highly skilled but very human, and it shows. It has that same sort of vibe to it. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I do regret is I didn't think of a way to get Lupin in here because, but we're going to cover Lupin. Yeah. Yeah. Cause Lupin do definitely it. maybe we'll cover each season of Lupin because Lupin is. Oh, oh God. So good. I, I have never loved the French show more than I love Lupin. Oh, it's so good. And we started season three last night because I've been, yeah. been busy. And the first episode, have you seen season three yet? I've seen the first episode so far. And that ending to the first episode, if people haven't seen it, Oh my God. Yeah. All yeah. right. That's it. Yeah. Um, all right. Do you want to tell people what we're doing next week? Do you want to tell them that we're actually going to do a jump back and cover Army of Darkness next week? Yes. We're talking. No, we're not going to do that. Um, this is right. The Evil Dead trilogy. We got to start with the first one. Eddie's upset <laughs> because I've included the Evil Dead musical in this series of things that oh, we do. Is there, was there an Evil Dead musical? Oh, my God. And it was fucking phenomenal. I saw it. It's part of my bachelor party week in Vegas. Yeah, I had a, wow. like a week bachelor party in Vegas. Wow. Well, all right, I say week. I, I've been known. To, it was only four days in Vegas. Um, Still. But wow. it was great. I saw it there. I love the music. Anyone that's listened to it, the best song is still going to be It's Time. So please, Eddie, what time is it to tell the people what we're doing? It, it is time for Earthshock. Um, we're going to go back into our classic Doctor Who run. 
um, naturally picking up with the fifth doctor. Um, and, and, and is it yes. finally time? Yes. Uh, I will tr- talk a lot about JNT. Um, he was a very complicated figure. Uh, uh, it, it's, it, it's a lot to dig into. Plus also we have a lot of, it's a huge cast too. I mean, we've got the doctor or new doctor and three companions to talk about. So there's a lot to talk about, try to condense it. I um, the Turtles team. uh, I will say uh, I am actually going to slash have already watched the Tales of the Tardis version of Earthshock. <gasps> I know that that is not available everywhere. Uh, so if you watch the Earthshock episodes, you're getting the same content, except for I'm getting slightly more of uh, the Fifth Doctor and Tegan hugging than you guys are. That's about it. So we're covering Earthshock. We're not going to cover Kinder. I I wanted to cover Kinder, but. We only had two to choose from, and what frankly, about the phenomenal episode Snake Dance? Okay, you're saying it like it's a bad thing, right? And and I actually kind of like both Kinda and Snake Dance. I like uh, Kinda. So, I didn't like Snake Dance. Um, I, so I mean, oh my god! So yeah, we're already starting that that episode, but just really quickly, uh, I feel like the Fifth Doctor run is is unfairly maligned. There's actually a lot of genuinely good stuff there. When you pick out what's good and bad, there's actually a lot of decent stuff in there um yeah. so it was actually kind of hard to pick down two episodes uh but it was uh, of the if we're gonna do this we have to do the iconic ones and that boils down or we have to talk about Urshak because spoiler hydric dies um and so it's, it's a big important oh! moment i didn't know that happened bullshit bullshit all right i will stop so Sherlock holmes stick. dies but it comes back to life they're spoiled a 125 year old story for you too Sherlock regenerated. Um, all right, so I, I will stop giving you stick and say that I am sad though that Eddie would not let me cover the best Fifth Doctor episode in all the world. What am I the Black Orchard. Now? Again, I, I will argue for Black Orchard. It's got a stupid ending and kind of ableist but other than that it's not bad <laughs> he, plays, he plays cricket all right um but yes the fifth doctor run in my opinion is better than sixth doctor i guess i will stop talking about doctor who <laughs> it, it's been a while since we talked about it so i'm getting excited right so we're which again point we're excited about it again that's good uh but if you want to talk to us about doctor who the best place to find us is darker who discord by chris's stuff at darker who blah 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 we'll see you next week fifth doctor bye blah. <laughs>